so often? Would yes, rather... I'm very good. We're actually live right now. So, um, oh. but yes, absolutely. Grab water <laughs> as needed. Hello. Great. Sorry. I was asking the question. <laughs> um, hello to those watching. Thank you and for your patience. Um, I was navigating some um, technical issues. I was trying to figure out how to get some pictures that I can sh share with you guys. Um, all right, without further ado, this is Spencer. Spencer is my friend from working on board ships. Um, he is joining us today as he's a cruise and travel chef. Um, he has gone around the world learning um, about all things food and all sorts of different sides of food. And um, you've cooked all around the world as well. So worked for a few different cruise lines. You have quite the the travel and culinary history. Um, so Spencer, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer. I generally go by Spencer Jason because my last name is quite the mouthful. Uh, wow. But <laughs> I'm from Long Island, New York, uh, where I'm actually at right now. I consider that my home base because I am a, a cruise and travel chef, uh, forever nomad at the moment. Um, I met Iris working uh, for Holland America Line, uh, doing America's Test Kitchen. So I was doing uh, America's Test Kitchen host. I was doing cooking shows uh, to support the brand going all over the place, um, which was just really incredible. Um, when the pandemic hit, I was actually living in Ireland, uh, studying for my culinary certificate in holistic nutrition, culinary medicine, and plant-based nutritional sciences. Um, and then Holland America asked me back um, to come back as an assistant cruise director for a bit. And the world did what it sort of did. Um, I came back home uh, to Long Island, uh, and I was brewing kombucha for a little bit. And before I knew it, I found myself back at sea uh, with Uncruise Adventures, now as a sous chef. Uh, they mostly do cruises throughout Alaska, but they're also during the uh, winter season right now in Hawaii and Mexico. So if you would have told me after leaving Holland America Line that I would be back on the water and traveling and, and really cooking anywhere, um, I wouldn't, I would probably believe you, but I would say I wouldn't believe you. And it's just been uh, a dream and amazing being able to uh, do all of it. Literally as a chef, they say you could cook anywhere. And this year I've realized you really can. And so you haven't been on board for a little bit now, but during your time off of the ship, you were down in Ecuador. Yeah. Yeah. So I just came back from Ecuador. Um, I was doing a plant medicine retreat um, over there and they also had, uh, I've, I've always sort of wanted to do the retreat chef thing. So I was checking out kind of the, the food scene down there. Um, and before that, I was getting all of my certifications to work on yachts to continue uh, the Caribbean and the Mediterranean uh, yacht, yacht scene as well. So lots of lots of food uh, interests, and, and it's just wild to see what places are doing now, especially I used to be a bartender uh, as well when I started working with Holland America Line. I sort of needed something to, uh, there was so much training involved that I needed something in the interim, and I started bartending, which I realized as a bartender, you're a chef of cocktails. And uh, now I'm exploring the spirits in other countries. And it is what they're starting to do with with alcohols and, and different uh, ingredients to really showcase the uh, the countries and the and the flavors of where 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 they're grown and, and what the countries represent is really incredible. Do you have an example of that that you could share? Or like, so say we're, you know, pick a place in the world, we're visiting there, what's a cocktail? What's something that is, you know, that you feel is the equivalent of, you know, the, the food that represents it? What's the drink that represents it? Oh, uh, well, in a lot of places, uh, of course, well, just being in Ecuador, there's two main things that I found that were really intriguing. Uh, one is called Zamir. Um, and there's not a lot fully known about Zamir, um, except Outside of Ecuador, people may call it rum. It is made from sugar cane. But if you're in Ecuador, they will specifically say it's not rum. It is Zamir. Um, so it's another sugar cane distilled drink. Um, and it's interesting because when the rules come to uh, how to make rum, you really can make it just about from anything. Traditional rum is molasses, but uh, things like uh, cachaça um, in Brazil, it's all different sugar cane drinks. And the cool thing about South America and the Caribbean is they really do pride themselves in um their, their sort of national drinks. Um, and the Zamir that you would normally find in a regular, uh, it's got a, like a red and uh, yellow bottle. If you Google it, 
um, is kind of the stuff that puts hair on your chest, as some people would say. It's very strong. Um, it's kind of like the the the, top, the the bottom shelf stuff, but now they're really starting to age it. They're starting to do a little more craft um, Zamirs that um, are really competing with a lot more of the, the spirits that are down there. There's one other one that I found really fascinating. It's called Mishke, and I may be pronouncing that wrong because uh, – it turned out that even Ecuadorians didn't really know what this stuff was. I went to a lot of different restaurants and, and bars and liquor stores looking for it. It's spelled M-I-S-K-E. Depending where you go, it also may have a Y at the end. Um, and it's sort of like Ecuadorians' version of uh, Mezcal, um, which oh. if you don't know what Mezcal is, it's sort of, uh, I call it smoky tequila because uh, tequila Tequila has to come from Jalisco and it has to be 100% blue agave. Pretty much anything else is mezcal. And they generally smoke and cook the agave before they distill it. And mishki is kind of Ecuadorian's version. And it doesn't necessarily even taste like mezcal. Um, and it was amazing that it took so long to find. I actually found a restaurant that had two different bottles and they sold it to me, which I was super excited about because the amount of locals that I went and I said, I'm looking for this spirit. I found it online just looking as to what Ecuador has uh, Ecuador has to offer. And people were going, what? We don't know what this is. This isn't this isn't real. And then it was amazing when I found actual bottles that I would ha have had to travel uh, three or four hours to go and find at this restaurant. And really interesting stuff as to what they're starting to do down there. That is that's super. I hadn't I mean, that's very interesting. I hadn't really <laughs> thought of the cocktail side of things. Um, as you know, I've been to, to Greece and I've had Uzo and I've been to Italy and I've had Limoncello, but I hadn't, you know, it just, I hadn't thought of it from the culinary side of things. Yeah. And especially like you said, with Uzo and Limoncello, it's like now when you're talking about places that start to infuse the flavors, uh, you get a lot of uh, chocolate liqueurs, uh, coffees being used in a lot of things as well. Um, have you been to um, Florida Cana in Nicaragua? No. Okay. It was one of the tours that we were able to do with, oh, with home. No, no. And it's a, a world renowned um, rum distillery. Um, and they make this coffee liqueur that is just out of this world. And I was not a coffee drinker until I started going to places that actually grew coffee. Yeah. Uh, to really understand the flavors. And uh, it's kind of like a lot of um, like cacao and a lot of other things in the world now the regions really do showcase their flavors, but each region really does have their own specificities uh, to the flavors uh, because you got to think the soil is different. The temperature is different. All of these things uh, really do. It's like wine in, in France and, and pretty much anywhere in, in New Zealand. If you pair up the old and the new versions of wines that may come from the same grape, you still have things that taste totally different because the environments are different and the soil and composition and all of that really does translate into what you're tasting. And it's really amazing right. that these countries that sometimes we don't even think about are really starting to showcase what they have to offer. Um, it's great that you've been able to experience that and, you know, appreciate it as much as you have. I, you know, the first, I am not personally a coffee drinker, I was lucky enough to go to a coffee plantation in um, Guatemala and it really opened, like I it only went on the tour because it's what shore excursion said, yep, you can go on that tour today. And I was like, okay, sure. I'll go learn about coffee. And it gave me such an appreciation for, for literally the coffee bean, the bean itself. I'm like this, you've been through a journey. This coffee mm -hmm. bean has been through such a journey to get there. Um, well, the so, amount of people that also don't realize that there's a fruit around the coffee bean. Mm, mm -hmm. you know, that they, the bean is yeah. essentially the seed and the, the coffee fruit that's around it, it's similar to like cashews where the fruit that comes from a cashew plant is highly perishable. So you don't find a lot of things, especially here in the U.S., um, that you can try and taste these uh these ingredients because you actually really have to go there. The right. only time I've ever tasted a coffee berry or a coffee cherry, as they call it, right. was being at the probably the same tour. And they said, just pick it, pick it off the, the tree and eat it. And with the farms that I've worked on in the past, there's nothing like actually tasting something that's either straight off the vine, off the branch, out of the ground. Just amazing stuff. 
So we have a comment from Lou. Um, Lou is fabulous. He's very supportive of my blog and my channel. Um, and he said he's tried various specialty drinks, such as, do you know how to say that one, Spencer? Caprihena is one of my, one of my favorites. Um, that, that cachaça I was talking about from Brazil is used in a Caprihena. Ah, very nice. Uzo in Greece and Limoncello in the Amalfi Coast. And it's one of the best things about travel, local coffees, drinks, and food. 100%. And yes, absolutely. So um, on the food thing, so food thing, I say that so casually, I'm sorry. Um, it's so much more than a food thing. So you were in Ecuador. Um, you were mm -hmm. studying plant. Guide me on that one. Yeah. So in Ireland, I was uh, studying uh, plant medicine, holistic yeah. nutrition, and uh, the, now they're starting to call it lifestyle medicine um, okay. and uh, plant uh based nutritional sciences. So it was a raw vegan course that really inf in infused holistic health. Okay. And then in Ecuador, what was the... Uh, that was a, it was a plant medicine retreat that was based off oh, of the meditation. Uh, we did some shamanistic uh, medicines that are also down in the Andes um, as well. Um, just really on uh, personal growth. Um, and of course, life's about networking. So you never know who you're going to meet. Um, I love yeah. doing the... Uh, uh, retreats always have a chef and I love being sort of in that world and uh, seeing what uh, places have to offer and, and what they're serving. And uh, it's a great way to kind of get new ideas. Absolutely. All right. So you were kind enough to send me some pictures to use for this Ooh. and let's go ahead and dive into, so we're getting into more of the cruise side of your travel um and what are we looking at in this picture here oh so this is uh last last summer uh this is lampu glacier behind us um so the two main companies i worked for uh with holland america line was a, a larger ship company still not the biggest out of the ones that now are around but uh the company that i work for now on cruise uh the ship that i was on held about 74 guests compared to the couple, uh, what, 1100 on some of the ships that we were on, a little bit more. Um, so we have really small ships that can get you into places that the bigger ships can't. So with this company now, I was able to actually kayak almost right near Lampu Glacier. So that's sort of what you're seeing right now. And it was absolutely wild. You can never really imagine how big these things are until you're sitting on it, sitting right next to it in a kayak. And that's still probably about a mile or two away from us. What? is wild um so i was looking up on cruise and their ships hold between 22 guests and 84 guests depending on which of their ships you're on and that's it's i mean that's less than what is in a regular lifeboat for a cruise for a cruise ship like yeah. it's wild, to it's, me. It's wild. It, it the the small ship the 22 is sort of like a small little mega yacht um mm -hmm. and then of, then we just get bigger from there and every ship really is different. They, they have their own character on it. Um, the way it's laid out, the, the food that you get, uh, we came from where you sort of have this cookie cutter experience, which of course, when you get to companies that are that big, you need consistency and there's great consistency with on cruise, but the chefs at least, um, and the guides have a lot of flexibility to make your cruise the, the, the end all be all cruise of, of your experience, what you're experiencing, the crew is experiencing. Uh, we were in, I think, Icy Strait Point um, at one point watching incredible whales. We had we, this huge whale show and we had a guest that said, you probably experience this every, every day or every week. And, and I looked right at him. I said, I haven't seen this in five years of me cruising. Like what you're experiencing right now is what we're all experiencing. And the smaller ships, like you can you can do that and it's been really really wild so with the smaller group so 74 guests do you find that you're able to so you're saying that you it's there's consistency but at the same time you have more opportunity to mm. kind of adjust things for the group that's there so you know 84 guests it's probably not going to all be from the same family but do you still find that you're able to kind of adjust to the vibe of the cruise uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, there really is something for everybody, uh, which is the beauty, I think, of any cruise ship and, and company. Uh, one of the biggest things is uh, 
you pick the company kind of on what you're looking for. And with Uncruise, it's expedition uh, cruise ships. So you're not going to have your late night, big spectacular of singers and dancers. You're going to learn about the area. You're going to really, it's really an expedition adventure of getting into the nitty gritty of, you know, they, they tell you to bring your rain gear. Um, and uh, our demographic is, is so, a little similar to Holland America Line. Uh, I would say a little bit younger. Um but really, it was hard to kind of pick what the demographic was in the sense of age range because there was people of all uh, ages, all interests. Some people who didn't want to go kayaking could go on a skiff tour if they didn't want to, you know, do as much movement. Uh, there's also hiking. There's paddleboarding. Uh, but the biggest thing that I think everybody with Uncruise has in common is that they're there for an incredible nature-esque experience. Um, with Holland America Line, some people just wanted to sail and never leave the boat. Uh, mm -hmm. Generally here, they're interested in being this close to, to a glacier and maybe hiking on the ridge. So yeah. I would say that's the biggest difference, uh, but that's the big thing with cruise companies. Whatever experience you're looking for, if you find the right company, you could have an incredible experience. Absolutely. Um, and speaking of different cruise lines, so this is a cruise line I haven't sailed on before, but Lou mm -hmm. is asking if we're familiar with Sea Dream, which is a mega yacht with only 112 mm -hmm. guests. So I'm not, I haven't ever sailed on um, the Sea Dream. I haven't ever sailed on them before. My kind of the first time, maybe not the first time, but when they really came um, into my, you know, sphere was they were one of the first ships that opened up um, post -pand pandemic last year. Um, they had a sailing across from Europe to the Caribbean, and then they were one of the first ships that were sailing in the Caribbean. So that's kind of where I became more familiar with them um, and what they were offering. And they did great. They had quite a few, you know, cruise um, bloggers and vloggers that were on those voyages. So it definitely, you know, made me more aware of them as a company. Um, but I have not sailed with them before. Yeah, I haven't heard about them too much either. I know when you're saying where where uh, sh first ship that was allowed to sort of sail and stuff. I think at the moment, Uncruise is the only ship that is able to sail in uh, Hawaii, uh, or uh, that may have changed now. But at least when things were kind of getting yeah. really interesting, um, there was a news article about Uncruise being being able to still sail in Hawaii while uh, sort of everything was kind of still closed. So, can you speak to part of why that is? Uh, I think the big thing, uh, and I'm not on that, I'm going to actually be in, in, on the ship that goes to Mexico uh, or that's in Mexico right now going through Baja, California. I think the biggest thing as to why that is, is size. Uh, I think the, the, small, the smaller ships are a bit more manageable uh, when it comes to what's going on right now. Also, Uncruise is, is very dedicated to make sure that what needs to be followed is followed uh, in the sense of precautions and things um, just to make sure that guests and crew are safest and also to have the best experience they can, even while there's so much uncertainty going on. So uh, I, I would say, again, not being on that ship, I don't know exactly what may, you know, how that all worked out, but uh, from working on it uh, for the last year or so, being on the ships and how safe they feel and how happy people are to be on them, I would say it's the commitment that Uncruise has to make sure that they meet all the criteria they need. And in reality, smaller ships are just easier to, to maintain uh, those guidelines, I think, at the moment. Yeah. Um, out of curiosity, do you know where Uncruise ships are registered? Uh, most, I believe, are in the U.S. There are a few. I think the ones that sail outside of the U.S., um, I think... Um, I'm trying to think now where the ship that goes to Mexico, I think may be registered in the Bahamas. Um, but off the top of my head, don't quote me on it. Um, I don't fully remember. I think each ship just has a, has a, a bit differences. Um, so I was thinking um, part of the reason that Uncruz might also be able to sail to somewhere like Hawaii is that if they have less than a hundred guests and are registered in the U S and then follow the, you know, requirements to be registered in the U.S., then I don't think that they have to follow the Passenger Vessel Services Act. Mm -hmm. um, or no, maybe, no, it was Canada that was doing the Yeah, right. it was Canada. That was the less than 100 thing. Mm -hmm. But, but that still goes to show. 
like Sorry, even for us, when we um when when everything when Canada first released that, that even for us we pretty much just went straight from Seattle right to Alaska. We we passed through Canadian waters, but you know there was no stopping. And that's like the biggest thing with on cruise right now as well is to still give you the best experience. And this may be a piece. I think in Hawaii they do get off in a few different ports, but for Alaska season we literally and this is the biggest difference between the two companies as well. Uh, with uh, the bigger ships, you're stopping. It's more of a touristy, let's shop, let's, you know, what can we experience? Um, with Uncruise, your, essentially your expeditions and your excursions are all included in what's going on um, on the boat. And right now you're hitting, so Monday morning, you may be at Lampoo Glacier. Monday afternoon, you're at Marjorie Glacier. Tuesday morning, you're into Cats Bay. Wednesday, you're sp spending all day you know, by, uh, by South Sawyer and going through Icy Street Point. So you're also not getting off the ship, um, except for bringing guests on and bringing guests off. Uh, so that may also be part of, uh, the, with the style, at least on the Alaska side of things. I mean, again, with safety, it was pretty great. We were sort of just right. every day we were at a new incredible spot to just look at. So, um, so from the culinary side of things, so mm -hmm. on your cruises to Alaska, you weren't, you were doing a lot of exploration, outdoor nature related, yeah. um, but were you able to, where did you, did you get off the ship to go ashore to experience the, the food in different places or were you more bringing stuff on? With Uncruise, um, we only, we start in Juneau, you know, we pick up all of our food, um, and then we sail and, and all the food that we're eating is uh, on the boat. So th the biggest difference, unless we were fine, like your experience is really created by the guides that are there. So a lot of them are experts in ecology and wet, you know, wet marine life. Uh, so my culinary uh, appetite was definitely satisfied by a lot of sea asparagus. Um, yes, but right. the way that the, this company is because we are going to all different places, uh, in, inside Glacier Bay, and we're not really stopping anywhere for provisions. We pick everything up in, uh, Juno and that whole week. Now that I'm a sous chef, I'm also not necessarily exploring as much. I've been very grateful that I have had some opportunities to still go out and kayak. And of course, when you see pictures, you think all I may be doing is being yeah. out on the water. Uh, but the jobs are very different. Um, I really missed actually being in the kitchen uh, after my time between going to back to back to school and doing the cooking shows. And when this opportunity came up, I said, great, great way to get back into the kitchen, uh, learn some new skills, learn some new styles. Uh, learn from new and, and other chefs um, instead of doing my own thing. And I've been really grateful to be able to kind of do the two of them where I'm still exploring. I'm still on a small boat in Alaska. I mean, I may be in the galley for 12 to 14 hours a day, but Marjorie Glacier is right outside my window. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. So it, it, and that was probably one of the most revolutionary moments. Like I said, when, when I first started uh, with this call, my whole life as a chef, people have said, you can cook anywhere. And in theory, you understand that. And it's like, yes, you know, everybody needs to eat. You know, there's there's restaurants everywhere. And everybody, of course, thinks restaurants is the end all be all when you hear you're a chef. But there's so much more out there as uh, as we see. Uh, but the the biggest thing was I I was literally right in front of one of the glaciers. And I had this moment. I looked at my head chef and he was super grateful as to what it was just an incredible beautiful day probably similar the opposite of the sunset but super clear um just bright uh and he goes dude we're in alaska and i went you're you're absolutely right and i was making some dish because as sous chef i do a lot of the crew food as well um and yep. then i help the uh head chef with uh sides and first course and uh for the guests so i was making something that I had made a handful of years ago when I uh, was a, a local cafe owner in upstate New York. We had started a catering company and food production, and we were making jams and jellies. And I was making a strawberry balsamic and basil jam to go with a baked brie for happy hour uh, while making some kind of risotto for the crew. And it was the 
almost the same menu as I had done for a catering event. And I just went, oh my gosh. Years ago, I did this in upstate New York and I'm making the same dish now in, in Alaska. And it yeah. just so happened. That's when it hit me. I was like, I really can cook anywhere. Right. And I am. And it was uh, the head chef and I really just had a, a moment of gratitude of just realizing that we are in a very versatile industry. Mm -hmm. And you were appreciating the fact that you're getting to explore the world. I, I feel like I feel like once you've been, it's like the, my first cruise contract, I was offered either Alaska or Bermuda. And I chose Alaska because it was a further flight away. It's like, I'm from Vermont. So it's like, if I need to get on a ship in Boston and go to Bermuda, that's, you know, I just have to basically pay for the cruise. I don't have to pay for the airfare. Yeah. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to take this chance with my free, free flight and head up to Alaska. And then I get there and I realize that, you know, the majority of mainstream cruise lines have quite a few ships in Alaska and that a lot of crew, if they've done more than one or two Alaskan seasons, end up kind of jaded by it because they're like, we're doing the same run. We're in the same place. And the thrill of it kind of dissipates for a lot of the crew. And it's nice to hear. <laughs> I, I try to focus on appreciation and gratitude when I'm in these incredible places and not just like, okay, no, we're in Juno again today. Be like, oh my gosh, we're in Juno. This is so cool. Um, and so it's nice to hear that you were able to find that. Yeah. Well, it's kind of hard, especially when you're working. You know, I think a lot of times people look at our photos and hear where we are and what we're doing and they forget that it's also a job. It's also um, a job. And yeah. for what we were doing with Holland America Line, we maybe had a lot of great perks and we had a lot of benefits in the sense of being able to explore uh, where we were, maybe a little bit more than most, but we were still working. It and was so trying yeah. to balance traveling and working as well is exhausting. And, it but, is. and, so and you sometimes, it's not that you lose the gratitude, but after about five or six months of a contract, yeah, sometimes like, all you want to do is just go out. home. It's like, I'm just going to go take a nap. I know yeah. that we're in this beautiful place, but right now sleep is more important. Yeah. And that's, and, and I think right now, which I, I've always loved Alaska, uh, going to culinary school in upstate New York and my, all of my jobs have had some kind of nature oriented part of the position, uh, whether it's in a nature esque place, or I've actually been able to hike and kayak and things like this. I've been super grateful about that. Um, so it's, but I think also with the way that the world has formulated itself in the last two years, it's made me even extra grateful, especially in the food industry. Um, I got this job at the height of the pandemic, uh, right after all the shutdowns were lifted, uh, and there were still a ton of restrictions and things. And we were, we were literally one week at a time, didn't know if, you know, next week we would all have to just hang out and no more guests or we didn't know what was going to happen. So the fact that we were, especially for our industry and the cruise in, in cruising in general, we were one of the only boats that were out, um, out there. So yeah. for one, that made it an incredible experience because there were no other ships in around us for, for the time where we're used to seeing at least two or three passing us. Yeah. But for more, it just led to me reminding myself that there are so many in the industry that are still sitting at home waiting for their countries to uh, lift up uh, regulations and, and uh, shutdowns. And here I was in Alaska and yeah, maybe I'm spending my whole season in Alaska, but um, I could be back on Long Island, you know, again, yeah. it's, it, it, they're, they're, they're definitely gave a very big moment of there. I won't say that I was never tired. I was definitely tired, especially with the restrictions we had, we were working full tilt um, to get to get the food out, to make sure that everybody was safe, to do it properly. Uh, but we we went probably from like that 5% to like the 1% in the sense of the way that our industry shut down. There were no other ships out at the time. We were one of the only ships in Alaska. So it made it really hard to kind of get jaded by it because I had to just keep reminding myself that here I am. Here, yeah. here, you know, the, the photo shows it. It's like, yeah. you, can, you don't get more secluded than this, but at least I'm still cooking. I'm still traveling. There's so many people in the food industry. I just spoke to a guy yesterday who's now selling insurance. Um, and he loved being in food, but 
there are so many people who just are aren't interested where it's going or it's you know that day-to-day uncertainty is really tough and the fact that i was able to find something like this there's just there's there's gratitude and love that's that's all i can say is is it puts a lot into perspective oh yeah this uh past couple years has been hard. I I mean, I think we both still have a lot of friends that are unsure what their future holds. Do they want to go back to cruise ships? Do they not want to go back to cruise ships? We have friends in countries that, like Lou is saying, Australia is still locked down. And it's like, you know, whether their whole career just yeah, totally upended, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's where, where some people ask me in the sense of going from cooking shows to being back in the kitchen as a sous chef, I had my own healing and, and reasons as to why I wanted to go back into the kitchen. Uh, But really it still just, it facilitated allowing me to do what I love. Uh, And being on the smaller ships, I'm one of four people or five, depending on the ship in the galley. So it's still, I'm not like in the galley. Yeah. There's not a lot of us. So it's not like with Holland America line, there's like 104 people in the galley. It's Four. So it's usually a head chef, a sous chef, depending on the size of the ship, there's two sous chefs, a pastry chef and a galley utility. So we're really working together to make it all happen. And because it's also so the ships are so small, there's no time where the guests are not seeing the crew unless they're sleeping. Uh, so that interaction that I loved with Holland America line uh, and the position that it came with, with that position, we had a lot of, uh, crew and guest interaction, which was great. And for me, I love being sort of on the front lines and people asked, Hey, being back in the kitchen, like, don't you hate it? Like you're just, you're just in the kitchen. And it's with these companies, they're so small that you're still making incredible experiences together with the crew and the guests that are there. So from the crew side, um, if you're on one of the larger mainstream cruise lines, um, even the majority of the luxury ships, you have all the passenger decks and then below the passenger decks, there are some crew decks. Mm -hmm. Um, And on the first deck below the passenger decks, um, you will likely have the crew mess. You might have the crew bar, um, you know, different human, human resources, those kind of, you know, crew services Mm -hmm. might be down there. What is that like on one of these small expedition ships. Do you have a crew deck or do, are you literally just, you know, I know it's, the experience it's not. <laughs> when you go, so like if you're on a mainstream ship and you go from the passenger areas where, you know, you've got a smile and I don't say you've got a smile as a bad thing towards passengers, but remember that's the job part of it. Yeah. You're always um, on. And then when you go downstairs, you know, you can just like, that's where you're more let your true self out. Um, do you have the space where you can just kind of like no. with your uh, other so, members? Yeah, let me, we, before I answer that, I just want to explain this photo here, uh, just in oh, the yeah. contrast of ships. Uh, so this this was taken the first time that I was on um, in Alaska on a big ship. And this is that same glacier. Uh, now there, it's receded a bit, but um, so this actually, this picture is interesting too, uh, because in the back, you can see the Holland America ship. And that was the first ship I was ever on in Alaska. And then across from it, you can see a little white dot. And that's the uncruised ship. <laughs> um, so you can see the size difference and also how much closer we can get to things. Um, so the picture beforehand, that was the same glacier, but you can see literally how far away the bigger ships sort of have to be. Um, on the big ships, generally, they spend one day in Glacier Bay. With Uncruise, we spend two um, because we could just get into more uh, spaces. Uh, so it was really surreal that the first ship I was ever on in Alaska was one of the first ships that were able to actually sail again as a, as a big cruise company. Um, same Glacier, two incredible experiences, but also two very different experiences. Right. But um, so the, the crew quarters for the smaller ships... There really aren't any, except for places to sleep. There's really no crew hangout. We do have a crew lounge. Um, every ship is a little bit different where it is, and um, but it's essentially the size of a guest room, um, just so we have a place to watch some TV or, or a movie um, and just hang out a little bit. Uh, depending on the ship you're on as well, the ship that I worked on this season, 
there's an area called the fantail, which uh, guests usually can't go to because it is um, it's just a crew area. Let's put it that way. Um, it's it's so close. It's much closer to the water. It's a depending on the size of your fantail. Sometimes we could go out and have some tea and uh, you know, but we'll hear it's right by the engine as well. So you'll hear all of the uh, or the the propellers. So you'll hear the boat moving. Um, but the, that was kind of like our hangout spot besides the crew lounge. Um, but most of the time, especially with these cruises, um, it's you're sleeping, you know, your, yeah. your, your time, uh, off, you can enjoy the crew lounge, but most of the time it's, you're, you're in the, in your quarters and you're going to bed or enjoying it. And, and all the crew quarters are different. I mean, my first like six to 10 weeks with on cruise, I had one roommate. And then I was on another ship where I had seven. Uh, so, seven yeah, uh, it was a, a spot in the sort of the the bow of the ship uh, that just has a lot of space for beds. Um, but we're all we're all there under the understanding is like this is what it is. It's also not like with Holland America Line where we worked, you know, four to six months at a time, and some people worked even longer. Uh, with uncruise, generally you're on a six week on. Uh, two to three week off rotation. So the fact that you may have, you know, two, four, six roommates uh, doesn't it. Obviously, it's interesting still living with seven people, but because you're sort of on this work sleep. And then if you're not, if you're hanging out, you're in one of the crew lounges. Um, right. Everybody just kind of knows that it's just what we're there for. You know, there's there's no. Yeah. You you have your normal crew stuff that kind of goes on, but it doesn't necessarily go on as much uh, because there's really no time. So the normal crew stuff that you're talking about, you're talking about drama, romance, all the good stuff. Just people. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's the best part about I think the best part about cruises um, and working in the industry is that rotational schedule. Uh, the autonomy is really great, but and it's a double edged sword of the duality. Um, you know, there's a, you, you may get on board and there's someone who you don't get along with, but generally in like two weeks, they won't be there anymore. It's true. The same and, goes but, for supervisors and it's, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You get on board, you have a supervisor. You're like, I can't, you know, but it's like, oh, they're going to be gone in a month. And, you know, I yeah. haven't worked for uncruise, but working for, you know, a larger cruise line, it's like, okay, this, this supervisor is driving me nuts. They're gone in a month. You get another person and they're great. It also goes the other way. If there's someone that you get along with super, super well, and then all of a sudden they're gone and you're like, I might never see yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. The big difference for, for uncruise um, is generally when the season starts, you're on that ship for the season. So with Holland, once our contract was over, we generally went to another ship and then maybe we went back to the same ship, like in two rotations. Yeah. Uh, generally for us, because and, and it helps with the ship camaraderie as well, especially with the way that the seasons are. Um, after six weeks, you'll have two weeks off and then you go back to the same ship uh, unless you're in a position. So like this season, I'm going to be a, in a relief position. So you may if you're not in a relief position, you have sort of your home ship. You know, you know, you'll always go back to this one. If you want to leave your shoes there for your time off, you could leave your shoes. Oh, there. Yeah. Um but for me, with the relief position, you essentially relieve the people who have their home ship. So I'm going to spend four weeks on one ship called the Safari Endeavor. Um, and then I'll be on the, the uh, Wilderness Adventure for two weeks. So I, I'll, I'll, the, the sous chef that is on that ship consistently, I take over for so that they have some time off. Right. And then I go to another ship, relieve another. So it gives me a little bit also autonomy as well, because last season I was on the same ship for six weeks. This mm -hmm. season, it changes it up a little bit. You meet more people. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing how that how that turns out. Um, yeah, that should be interesting. I've done it where I've gone to the same ship over and over. And then I've done it where I've gone between different ships. And it's all very, it's, it's a different experience for mm -hmm. both. So. Yeah. Well, that's what I also loved with the big ships too. It was very individual, um, especially for us where our contracts were shorter. It was so interesting where we would be on one ship and then between fill-ins and our normal contracts, 
two or three contracts later, we'll be on another ship and see someone who usually has a nine month contract and they'll be like, Oh, I saw you last contract. And then I'll be like, like last contract. Are you what do you mean last time? Yeah, it was. And yeah. they're like, Oh, you know, on the, on the Mazdam. And I was like, Oh, that was like four ships ago. But then yeah. I had to remember like, Oh, you had a nine month contract. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. The different, cause you know, even if everyone's a crew member, they have everyone's experiencing a very different situation yeah. and different experience. And I think it's a great metaphor for life in general. Um, oh, a lot yeah. of times we compare or we, you know, get into sort of, and we talk about people and living with everybody, you kind of get into, into everybody. Um, mm -hmm. But we all have different lives. We all have different experiences, you know, especially when it comes to contracts and stuff, it's like you signed your contract, I signed mine, you know, every, all that stuff, professionalism and personal life and things. Um, I think a lot of times in on ships, we get very into because we're with each other so much. A lot um, of we yes. get into each other's lives a little bit. And it, it it's a great metaphor to re just remember. It's like we're all we're all living together, but we're all also living our individual lives. And you never know what someone else may be going through, or what they're doing or how they got to their um, their their situation. And it was very humbling coming back as a sous chef after doing cooking shows for a while. And um, I had a few different head chef um, positions over the years. And I really wanted to be a sous chef to, to learn some new skills and um, get some more experience with other chefs. And mm -hmm. it really was interesting. Even the America's Test Kitchen job. I mean, everybody comes from different walks of life. I mean, I was 25 when I started working with Holland America Line and there were people in my position that were 55 and it was amazing to see what they had done to get to this point and yeah. you know vice versa what i had done to get to this point but i still also had another 30 years to reach their age right. so it really goes to show it's you know we're all sort of we're all playing the same game but we're all we all have our own yeah yeah everyone's kind of path is different we're all on yeah. a different trajectory and um, all right, we've only got a few story. minutes <laughs> left. Let's talk about, um, we've got a few pictures of different foods and things. So let's yeah. talk about what are we looking at in this picture? So this was um, one of my best culinary experiences. I was in the Trang, Vietnam, and I was starving. At first, I looked. I was looking for a place to eat, and I couldn't really find anywhere where I wanted to go. Um, it's a bit industrial. It's it, it, They're really, it was like a... about two and a half hours and as you know how it is looking for food you get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier and then finally you're about to go into a place where you don't even care what it is but you go in it anyway because you're just so hungry um i got to this place and then i turned around and i saw this huge line of people and i had to go check out what it was and it turned out to be these three old vietnamese women and this giant fuss station that was right on the street and I was like, okay, here's where I have to eat. The line was wrapped around the, the it, it wasn't even a line. It was just this cluster of people that was coming into an intersection. And it cost me $1.50. I love it. And it was just, this place was so authentic that there was a woman washing dishes in a bucket. There you go. <laughs> Which there of course go. is always interesting. Um, and if you're, are, are you able to show that video? Oh, you know? yes, I can do that. Um, yeah. So it's it's always interesting going to other countries when you, especially being a chef and in, in, I think there's nothing more personal to somebody uh, than how they eat. I find the psychology of food super fascinating and generally how we all eat. We have so many particular things of what we're into, what we're not, um, especially when it comes to food safety and health. Um, I used to have a friend that I lived with. If I left the milk out on the counter for longer than an, like, a half an hour, 45 minutes, he would throw it out. And oh, geez. Wow. In, a, in, a, in, a, in a culinary standpoint, you've got four hours, <laughs> depending on the on the conditions. Um, but I also grew up, it was like, you leave the milk out, you put it back in the fridge. But with how we've grown up, it's all so different. So it's so fascinating watch, going to these different countries and you kind of see how things are at the market and you would be like, 
that would never be allowed back home. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's also super amazing. Um, so if we, if you want to show that video, there was a, a in, um, in Shanghai, there was a place called Smoky Cookie. And it was a cup of, Okay. Yeah. So it was a cup of, um, sorry, that's actually on my, I can't, I forget. You can't see my screen. I just had something. pop up. Um, okay. I'm gonna play, oh, sorry. If I, I'm going to play it right now. If that's okay. Yeah. You wanna explain okay. It? Play it? okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and it paused. Oh. Sorry. Keep going. There. Yeah. Sorry about that. It's loading. I've got the spinning wheel going right now. Well, while it's loading, I'll, I'll explain to you what's going on. So uh, the cup is full of something that looked like Lucky Charms, um, Cheetos, like puffy Cheetos, um, small little cookie crisps, and like, like fruit clusters. And they poured liquid nitrogen onto all of this breakfast cereal, weird snack create you know cup yeah. and there's actually two cups here you can see um and they give you these tongs to hold the smoky cookie or whichever or the or the smoky lucky charms and you have to wave it in the air until it starts to frost over because if you eat it right away it is so cold you're going to burn your mouth so you have to wave it until it frosts and then when you eat it it's still super cold but it's cold enough to where you're not you know it's like uh, in Dumb and Dumber, when he sticks his tongue yeah, to the yeah, yeah. pole, so you have to wave it until it's warm enough. And and you, who would think that you have to wave something to warm it off? Because normally we're cooling it off. Right. Um, and then when you eat it, all of the vapors from the liquid nitrogen come out of your face and your nose and your mouth, and it is absolutely wild. But of course, there's big signs that says "Don't drink the cup." Don't. And then of course you're trying to get the ones at the bottom, and you're trying not to spill it on you. Um, and it was just one of those things where I was like, there's no way that this would ever be allowed back at home. <laughs> Why? I'm sorry that this keeps freezing on me. It's a great spot for a deposit. Yeah. It's really yeah. entertaining. You look like that's a exactly, car. But that's exactly what it looks like. And then it's like all of a sudden everything just comes out. Um, and it was just super fascinating to see. And this is like, it really goes to show that sort of the worlds that we live in um, are ours uh, because you go to these other countries and this is just street food. That's just normal. Yeah. No, it's, I, I love being able to go around the world and experience all the different things that there are. I mean, it's definitely taken me, cruising has taken me far more out of my shell than I ever thought I would ever. Mm -hmm. um, so you so said Alaska was the first place that you had ever been? Alaska was the first place that I went for work on the ship. Mm -hmm. Um, I had, my mom had taken me cruising as a kid. Um, so I'd been on a few cruise lines, mostly in the Caribbean. And then I'd been to Europe a few times in college. Um, but work wise, Alaska was the first place that I went to. Cool. Um, all right. Well, that's being stubborn loading. Okay. Lou has a question for you. He is wondering if you see yourself ever going back to a larger traditional cruise line. Oh, um, it's always the hard question um, because my time with Holland America Line was so incredible and it really jump started my uh, love for travel. Uh, it has brought me to places that I only dreamed about going. Um, right now, I really do enjoy being on the smaller cruise lines. Uh, it really also depends on the job. Now that I'm also a little bit older, um, I guess I have a little bit more of an idea of what I want to be doing. I love doing the cooking shows. Um, I love, like I said, being on the front lines and I like with the smaller ships, even in the galley, I can still interact with the guests. Um, so on the bigger side of, uh, cruising, I would say the job would have to be right. Uh, that's kind of where I've been at right now is when the right job comes, I, I would not think about not going back to the bigger ones, but I'm happy where things are right now. And of course, grateful. So So you haven't ruled it out, but you're not saying yes. 
Right. Like, yeah. It, I, I'm, I'm a big sort of go with the flow and you also never know what may pop up around the corner. Um, like I said, I love doing those, the cooking shows. Um, I loved the amount of guest interaction Holland and Merkel Line allowed us to have. Uh, and of course the exploration that was involved as well. So I would definitely consider it if the right job came along. I like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like this is also, as you get older, you realize that life doesn't ever really go according to plan. You can plan right. something out and you think it's going to go one way entirely. And I have a good friend who loves to have the saying, uh, we plan and God laughs. Mm. And it really, especially in the last two years, we know it's like now I finally have another plan to get back to Ireland and kind of finish some things up. But living just kind of, oh, oh, I love Charleston. And so he had, she had a nitro teeny. Nitro teeny. Is that, yeah. is that sort of like with uh, like a nitro cold brew martini? I'm not sure. Let's see if Lou answers. Yeah. A nitro cold brew. Cold brew. Yeah. Now they. they... Yeah. Now you're intrigued. Now you're like, Ooh, tell me <laughs> I, was, I was just in Charleston a few uh, about last month. So now I'm, I've got to go back. I love Charleston. Yeah. Charleston's a great city. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, a nitrogen drink with a martini. So that's oh. what he, yeah. I'm going to have to look um, at you, if, if, if you can find out the restaurant, I'll definitely have to put it on my list. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lou, if you know the, the uh, Please let us know. <laughs> that was the cool thing about like that as well. What got me into cooking was uh, food science, actually, and, and nutrition. So once I heard that we could like freeze ice cream with liquid nitrogen and things like that, it's amazing. Ah, oh, the Peninsula Grill. Here we go. You have your your next stop when you're in Charleston. Yep, I'm going back. Um. All right, and the picture that we're showing here, mm -hmm. this is you in um on the uncruised ship. On yes. Right. Yes, so this was on the wilderness and uh, the wilderness discoverer, um, and the galley and the adventure and a few other ships look similar, but again, each boat is a is a little bit different. Um, I was making uh, French onion soup here to order, uh, and it was yeah. it was wild. It was great. Oh man, sign me up. That's one of my favorites. Oh well, next time I see you, we'll have to make it. Yes. Yeah, you'll have to. Oh man, you'll you can make me French onion soup, and I'm not sure what I'll make, but. I'll find something. <laughs> I'm, I'm very easy. I'm, I'm I'll allow you with my, with my culinary attempt. I'm Actually, great with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm allergic to peanut butter, so we're not going to oh. do that. Um, but let's see. I made, a, I made a sticky toffee pudding um, <laughs> yesterday, and it's delicious. So there we go. I'll bring you a UK yeah. delight. Cool. But this um, is also the great thing with uh, with the small ships, too, as you can see. You, we're literally right there. You know, yeah. you, you, there's sometimes people come and wave into the galley and uh, <laughs> it really also, it, it becomes, we become part of your experience, which yeah. is really cool. Cause unless you have the galley tour on the big ship, sort of the galley's kind of out of the way. Yeah. No, I know a lot of crew members that never even saw the galley. Which is like, wild. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. I have one question for you before yeah. we wrap up. Um, so going on an expedition cruise, so mm -hmm. on, so on a mainstream cruise line, whether it be Holland America, Royal Caribbean, Carnival, you're going to have a lot of times you have multi-generational groups sailing. So you've got right. kids, parents, grandparents, and they choose a cruise that's going to mostly mm -hmm. adapt to everyone. Everyone's, mm -hmm. you know, it might not be the exact perfect cruise line for everyone, but it's perfect for that particular group. Do you see much multi-generational travel with the expedition expedition cruises have you noticed that or is it mostly you know couples or solo travelers or what is kind of how does that vibe feel uh i would definitely still say that the demographic is pretty large um with the multi-generational uh, and and the i i haven't seen kids necessarily i think the oldest kid i saw was maybe 17 18 years old uh there may have been one some one person who was 13 so um for the little kids i haven't seen um too much with uncruise again i've only been there for one season and on one specific ship um 
but there are definitely families that go out. Uh, a lot of families who want a different experience. Some families uh, want to just disconnect their kids from social media and their phone. And they think that the best way to do that is to just be on a, on a, on a small cruise ship in Alaska. Um, there's older clientele. So I would still say that the, the span has been pretty large. Generally, I would say most of the people that I've seen on um, would probably be from their mid to late thirties to, um, you know, even their, the, the seventies um, age range. So there's still a pretty big age range. Um, these cruise ships are usually uh, with uncruise. It's only about uh, seven week cruises. There are a few 12 or 14 days. So it's a little bit easier with Holland America. We had like 29 day voyages. So uh, demographically, I mean, I don't know any 20 year olds who have 29 days to go on a cruise. Um, Not really. Not unless so it's think these... and then their parents are paying. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, I think these are a little bit more accessible for everybody. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that I see that everybody's interested in most mostly is that they're all really interested in nature. Uh, so okay. that's, again, finding the cruise that's right for you. But when it comes to at least age range and stuff, um, there it's all it's always nice when there's a little bit of a younger crowd as well there's definitely uh some people who i've interacted with who um you know sometimes there's more mature kids um and they're sort of looking for direction or what they want to do next and they realize that the cruise industry you could actually work on a on a ship you know yeah. uh i always love when there's younger people who realize like this could be your life uh but yeah it's it's pretty diverse uh on the on cruise side of things so Lou is saying usually couples and grandparents on the luxury small ships as it's too expensive to bring on small kids. Um, so I've never been on, on cruise. I've sailed on mm -hmm. Seaborn a few times and I would say that definitely mm -hmm. would yeah. carry with that as well. I would also say like the experience that you're looking for, like I cruised the first time I cruised, I was 10 or 11 years old and we did carnival uh, with uh, my yeah. mom had a friend who said, why don't we do this? My parents were miserable. Um, they mm. said they would never cruise again. Um, oh, no, that's not. But, yeah, yeah I, I took them though. Then on a Holland America Line um, ship when I was working there, and they found that they really enjoyed it. They thought that the way that Holland America Line went um, was really more their style. They really liked being engulfed in what they were doing. They weren't really big partiers, and that's not to say that Carnival's terrible. It was just yeah. for the type of people my parents are. They were looking for something different, which Holland America had to offer. Here uh, with Uncruise, because you are also, it, it, it's such small ships, it's adventure cruising, bringing someone who is, you know, between the ages of four and eight, there's nowhere to put your child. So right. uh, the same thing is like, if you, if you have kids who are a little bit more mature that can enjoy and appreciate where they are, I've definitely seen them on there um, to where I've had to tell parents and be like, I would never have thought your kid was so young because- they you know, were. they're engaged, they're here, they're talking to the, the staff, they're really interested in where they are, um, but they're not just a eight-year-old kid that's running around that doesn't realize that they're in Alaska and this glacier is, you know, right there. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we are going to wrap up. Thank you so much for, for joining me, for chatting with me. For Thank you, Iris. This has been great enlightening me about some expedition cruises. I have never done an expedition cruise. Um, I need to, I want to, it's on my list of things to do. Um, I certainly will look into on cruise as I do that. We'll chat. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll chat. Okay. We'll chat. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, especially for, uh, for Lou, for, for watching, for interacting yeah. with us. We appreciate it. Um, also, I know my hubby's out there watching as well. He's currently downstairs. Hi. And um, yeah, it was great chatting with you. And thanks again. Yeah. Thank, uh, if anybody is interested, um, uh, can I throw my Instagram out there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll um, I'm, at, I'm, I'm at, at <laughs> the Schmers. Uh, I told you my last name is a handful. So uh, at T-H-E-S-C-H-M-E-R-Z. Yep. Uh, I will I also link really to your Instagram in the comments. So if anyone watching wants to follow along with what Spence is up to this summer, what he's up to just as he goes around the world, because um, even when he's not on a ship, he always is traveling somewhere. 
um that way you can follow along yeah thank you and and thank you for everybody who's watching as well i've really appreciated being here and and talking about all this so uh get out there and explore the world yeah um and it has a z on the end right the schmurz yes with a z, with a z. okay yeah. all right i will leave it in the comments thank you thank you so much